Hey guys, we're back again with the Sharp X68000. And today, we'll be taking a look at PC emulation, a brand new disk image full of curated software, more games, music, graphics, and a new two-in-one upgrade that was just announced. All that and more coming up right now on Retro Bits. In the previous episode, we looked at the Midiori, a modern MIDI interface for the Sharp X68000. We also checked out the Gauss Panic, a RAM upgrade that makes it possible to play games that require more than the system's 2 megabytes of base memory. One game I have a love-hate relationship with is Dai Makai Muda, or Ghouls and Ghosts. I've showed this before, but up till now, I could never run it on real hardware. Here's what happens when you launch the game from hard disk without a RAM expansion. And now, with the Gauss Panic 6 megabyte card installed. This is as close to an arcade perfect home port as you'll find on any 16-bit era platform. If you're thinking, hey, this sounds pretty authentic too, you wouldn't be wrong. Here, the game is running on the built-in Yamaha YM2151, the same exact chip that's also found in Capcom's CPS1 hardware that runs the arcade version. I don't know what it is about this game that keeps me coming back to it on so many different systems. It's punishingly difficult, but it's also kind of the perfect arcade platformer. What do you think? Maybe I'm just a masochist. And now, with the Midiori and Roland SC55. Okay, so this is a step up from the arcade original, and that's always going to be polarizing. Give it a fair shake though, it's really not half bad, is it? Maybe even great. I think we can at least all agree that this is a fantastic port of a pretty legendary game. But before I get ahead of myself, let's take a step back and remind ourselves what this video is really about. If you recall last time, we looked at a handful of games that I'd acquired from Japanese auctions, all of which only booted from floppy disk. We ran out of time to look at other options, so let's take a few minutes and do that now. If you just want to see more gameplay, feel free and skip ahead. So maybe you're not into collecting rare, often overpriced games and paying exorbitant shipping prices to get them sent from Japan. Maybe you don't want to fiddle around with floppy disks or configuring software in Japanese, and you just want something that works out of the box. Well, 
You're in luck, because there's an easy button in the form of a new curated hard disk image by user Incredible Hark available on the NFG Games forum. This effort builds off of previous works and adds dozens of new games and other software, all pre-configured to be easily launched from a menu with little to no setup. It couldn't be easier to use the image with the blue SCSI V2. Just download the file and copy it to the SD card. Prefix the file name with HD0, and that's it! Three gigabytes of content ready to boot and use. It'll also work with SASE-based systems using a special bootloader and, of course, with emulators. I've also placed a small 10 megabyte image on the card as device ID 1 that I use for transferring files back and forth between my PC and the real hardware. The image contains over 550 games in total, categorized by genre. Many of them are floppy disk games that were never designed to run from a hard disk. But that's all been taken care of for us. There's no way we can possibly look at everything here, but many of the best titles the system has to offer are present, so hopefully you'll get an idea of what's available here to try. Yes, you can and should try the x68000's library, and I'll show you how easy it is to emulate shortly. As I've said in the past, if you're into shoot 'em ups, you'll be in heaven as there are 75 titles in the vertical category alone. How do these games run from the hard drive then? There are a couple different methods, but in this example, there are two 1.2 megabyte disk images in the directory and a batch file. If we take a look inside, we can see that this game uses the 2HD SIM program to mount the images as if they were real floppies. Many games came on more than two disks, which is one reason extra RAM is sometimes required, since all of the images need to be mounted before the game can be launched. Other games require more complicated setups than this, but thankfully all the hard work has already been done. Some titles couldn't be made to run from the hard disk. In those cases, the curator gave us the disk images and the tools to write them to real floppies. How thoughtful is that? In addition to games, there are plenty of other things on this image that we'll take a look at shortly. In multimedia, there are music files, high resolution images, and even a few videos. There are also useful tools, including compilers, a terminal program, heck, there's even a Macintosh emulator in here. There are also graphics tools, sound programs, and productivity apps. Finally, the image comes pre-installed with both the SX window and KO window graphic user environments, along with a few applications for each. Ready to try it out for yourself? Great, then you'll want an emulator. MAME is a solid option, but I've had good luck with XM6 Type G. This full-featured package supports a variety of system models and CPUs, SASE and SCSI hard drives, even external MIDI devices. You'll also need a complete set of ROMs extracted into the emulator directory. I've placed links to both in the description. Initial setup can be done in just a few steps. In the Options menu, select your model. Here, I'm using the XVI, which has the faster CPU and SCSI interface. 16 MHz is too fast for some games, so you may need to switch the setting to 10 if you have issues. Also, go ahead and max out the system's RAM at 12 MB. Next, in the SCSI tab, add a new drive and point it to the image file you downloaded from NFG Games. Finally, if you want to use external MIDI, pop over to the tab and enable the board at either ID. You can choose whether you want the built-in MT32 emulation or to pass the music data straight to your operating system's mapper for general MIDI games. Yeah, it's really that easy. Now, go and have yourself some fun with it. Let's take a look at some other games on the image. Hitting Q twice exits the menu system into the current directory, and autoexec executes the game, um, automatically. Eat. 
What we've got here is Fantastic Night Dreams Cotton, the first in the series of 10 games for both the arcade and home platforms. The X68000 received a close to perfect port of the 1991 arcade original, but with a few enhancements. A handful of games use the keyboard LEDs, and here we've got a light show for the music. Chase HQ uses them like flashing police lights that turn on when you approach the enemy vehicle. If you haven't played Panorama Cotton on the Mega Drive slash Genesis, you owe it to yourself to check that one out. It pulls off some pretty amazing tricks with the graphics that you wouldn't think possible on that hardware. Not that there's anything to complain about here. Cotton looks and plays great on the X. It's just one of a number of excellent cutem ups for the system. We looked at Street Fighter 2 in a past bit, but let's take a look at Super Street Fighter 2, the new challengers. This home port is extremely faithful to the arcade original. No surprise, as Capcom's CPS hardware was based on the X68000, and the system was used to develop the game. All 16 fighters and 15 stages are present here, and the game perfectly illustrates what the system is really capable of. Check out those huge detailed sprites, animated backgrounds, and multiple layers of parallax. There's also the new 8-player tournament mode, and the retail version even came with an adapter for use with the 6-button Mega Drive pad. One difference from the arcade is the external MIDI support as demonstrated here. The game also takes advantage of expanded hardware, including the additional PCM digital audio channels found on later systems. I didn't even realize that was a thing until just now, but it probably explains the sound dropouts we experienced in Fatal Fury during the last episode. If you were paying close attention earlier, you may have spotted this Famicom directory hiding among the other miscellaneous games. I was curious what it was, so I kicked off the start.bat file and just check out all this good stuff. I don't think this uses an emulator, but there are enough titles here to make me suspect that someone had, at some point, developed a process for porting these over. A cursory search returned no useful information, but if you know what the deal is here, please share with the rest of us in the comments. The sound isn't very accurate, but the gameplay's just like it should. Let's have a look at one more for good measure. Whoever ported these games did an excellent job though. You'd be hard pressed to tell the graphics apart from the real thing. Well, except for the fact they're on an RGB monitor. 
It's a neat peek behind the curtain of a system most of us didn't know about in its heyday, and a scene we're just starting to learn about almost 40 years after the fact. Here's one last title that I thought was interesting while exploring the racing category. This is called Tail Chaser, and given how many <clears throat> adult games there are for the X, I was worried it might be miscategorized. I've never heard of this one before, which is surprising because it's really quite ambitious. It's not even on Wikipedia's list of X68000 games. You don't see a whole lot of 3D on the system, especially ones that look this good with its flat shaded polygons and detail rich environment. Racing games need a reasonably high frame rate to be playable, and Tail Chaser is surprisingly successful in that regard. The X has no 3D hardware acceleration, so all the heavy lifting is down to the CPU. That's why I'm showing you this one in the emulator, using a 16 MHz CPU instead of on real hardware, as my machine only runs at 10. There's an entire page of settings that allow you to reduce the visual effects in order to run the game smoothly on lower spec machines like mine. Sharp did ultimately sell a model with an O30 processor, and there were accelerator cards available for earlier machines as well. Anyway, I was impressed with this one. <laughs> what a way to wreck. All right, I think we should move on from games and see what else there is to play around with on here. Earlier, we saw that there was a multimedia folder on the hard disk image, and inside there is a music subdirectory. So if we enter that, we see that there's a start.bat file. So we can hit QQ just as before, and that will launch MMDSP. Now, we looked at this program a long time ago in the Mr. FPGA core for the X68000, but what it is is a multi-format music player, and the hard disk image includes a whole bunch of directories full of game music, show music from different systems, different consoles, and different game titles. So let's take a look at some of those music files on the Sharp x 68000s built-in FM synthesis chip and PCM chip. This is a journey into sound. Hey kids, what time is it? This is a journey into sound. Get fresher than this. Get fresher than this. So a very competent system right out of the box, but we've got the Midiori card and we've got the SC55. So we should listen to some MIDI music too. Now I've placed a standard 
general MIDI MID file here in the directory with MMDSP. But as we can see, it doesn't show up in the directory listing. Now, I've seen other people playing MIDI files with this program, so I'm missing something or something isn't set up right here. So I went in search of the correct driver over on the NFG Games Archive. There's a music directory in X68 tools, so let's have a look there. It's great that there's so much stuff here, but there are no descriptions. So unless you know exactly what you're looking for, well, good luck making sense of any of this. And of course, the contents of the files are all in Japanese. Fortunately, with some help from a kind stranger on the forum, I was directed to the MCDRV software here. So with just enough knowledge to be dangerous, I loaded up the MCDRV driver, which was included on the hard disk image here. And as you can see, it does detect the Midiori board in IO slot one, which is great, we're making progress. So if we run MMDSP now, hey, look at that. The MIDI file is now showing up in our directory listing. So we should just be able to go down and hit enter. Uh-oh, that's not good. Disk is not inserted, please insert. Abort, retry, or ignore. Well, so I banged my head on this for like a whole week and I tried different versions of the driver. I tried different drivers entirely, different MIDI players, and they all had the same error. And finally, I figured it out and I tracked it down to the path statement that was defined by the hard disk image, contains drive A and drive B in it, but there's no disks in drive A or drive B. So whenever you try to run a command that isn't in the current working directory, you get that error. So what I did is I created a small batch file that just removes A and B from the path. And now if we run MMDSP, no more error. All right, progress. <laughs> it took me a while to see this, but if you look down here, this tiny little text, we're now getting another error, and it says smf to mdc.r file is not found. So what it turns out is that that binary is a helper file to go along with the driver, and it's not present in this working directory. It didn't come on the hard disk image. So what I've done is I've copied the entire archive over to my transfer disk, my other SCSI disk image here. And so all I have to do is extract the file from f colon mcdrv067.lzh into the same directory as the driver. And you can see that the binary of the driver already exists, but all these helper applications do not. So they're being depacked. And now if we run mmdsp, No more error. Also on the hard disk image is a directory full of pictures, and it contains a bunch of sample BMW images, but I thought it would be fun to convert some of my own, so that's exactly what I did. And what we've got here is a picture of my cat. This is Bob the Cat, aka Land Seal. Now the X68000 came out in 1987, the same year as VGA, and of course VGA had 256 colors. The Amiga, which came out two years earlier in 1985, had 4,096 colors on screen simultaneously in ham modes, but the X68000 beats them all with 65,000 colors on screen at the same time. Here's an image of the Golden Gate Bridge that I took last year, 
And finally, another picture that I like to use to test out the color capabilities of a system. Yeah, that's looking really good. Not too shabby. Let's have a quick peek at the SX window installation included on the image. This graphical user environment was released by Hudson in 1989. To put things in perspective, that was a year before Windows 3.0 even came to market. The interface is similar to Next Step, which also came out in 89. It's pretty intuitive given how early on this was, at least if you can look past the fact that it's all in Japanese. Luckily for us, there are a handful of applications and games included on the disk image to play around with, including not one, but two different versions of Minesweeper. This golf simulator is simple and reminiscent of the type of early desktop games you'd find on Windows PCs. Similar to how Windows 3 ran on top of DOS, SX Window runs on top of the Human 68K operating system and uses non-preemptive event-driven multitasking. Here's the GNU Chess engine coupled with an SX Window front end. So far, we haven't seen anything even remotely impressive running in this environment, but Maybe commercial offerings fare better? So here's the thing. SX Window has no hardware graphics acceleration, so the UI is a little sluggish and limited. Just like with early versions of Windows, you really need to drop back to DOS for games that run on bare metal. Some titles were available that took advantage of the pre-existing UI and widgets like SimEarth and SimAnt shown here. I've never played this game before and don't have any idea what to do though. Well, that was mercifully quick. What else have we got? Earlier, I made mention of this Mac emulator and I thought it would be fun to mess around with. Getting it to run required a whole lot of Google Translate and experimentation, but here it is. 800K Macintosh disks need to be converted and written to 1.2 megabyte five and a quarter inch floppies. But if you can get over that hurdle, it does actually work pretty well. There are over a dozen different emulators available for the X to try out, perhaps something for another day. It might be fun to run some benchmarks too. Maybe the fastest classic Mac isn't an Amiga after all. In the last episode, I finally found a good deal on MIDI and RAM upgrades after searching for over a year, and I was stoked. Barely a week had passed since my purchase when a new 2-in-1 upgrade card was announced for pre-order. I mean seriously, what are the chances of that? The X is so niche that new projects like this come along like, what, once every 3-5 to five years, if that? The price was right, about a quarter of the retail cost of a Midiori and Gauss Panic, so I jumped on the pre-order with only three slots remaining. The new card is called the Atari Kash Kosh, and it's the brainchild of Edu Arana, who you may already know from his other projects, such as the Tapuino Reloaded and Lazarus Storm. The project actually started back in 2019, with firmware by Miguel Fidesz and testing by Carlos Estrella. 
Due to shortages of the required Xilinx CPLDs, it took the team until now to see things through to completion. The name, according to the designer, means ready for the future, emphasizing the importance of planning and preparation in order to achieve long-term goals. Notice this USB port? In the future, the card will allow things like the MT32 Pi to be connected directly, similar to how it integrates with the Mr. FPGA. Additional capabilities such as audio output are planned as well. I look forward to putting the card through its paces when it arrives. Let me know in the comments if that's something you want to see in a future episode. All right, I think that's going to do it for today. I love that, despite its niche status, there are still people out there in the x68000 community working to advance the state of the art. So thanks to Incredible Hark, Shumetsu, and all of those who came before them for the latest disc image. Also to Edu, Carlos, and Miguel for the Atari Kosh Kosh. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits. Hey, since you're still here, why not click that subscribe button? If you'd like to support the channel, please check out our Patreon or YouTube channel membership options. And thanks to all of our supporters who help make RetroBits possible. You guys rock.